Welcome to the Grace Story Podcast, where inspiring stories are brought to life. This podcast is made possible by Grace College and Seminary, located on the shores of Winona Lake in the great state of Indiana. I'm your host, Dr. Drew Flam. This is the Grace Story Podcast. Today I have with me Rick Blackwood, lead pastor of Christ Fellowship Church in Miami, Florida, and he received his D-Men from Grace College and Seminary, and we'll talk about it, but he has a whole host of other degrees that he's achieved over the years, and he has done a wonderful job there at Christ Fellowship with a multinational congregation, and we're so thankful to have him with us today. Thank you, Dr. Blackwood, for being here. What's the weather like in Miami? Oh, it's snowing. Uh, there's a blizzard outside. Uh, we're under about two feet of snow. It's just right here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually did have snow up here yesterday. So uh, when I when I knew I was calling somebody in Miami, I, I wondered if we could just do it live and I fly down there. You should. You should. <laughs> I remember my days at Grace. I would I would leave here like from a tropical paradise, palm trees, and I would land in the snow. I would always go through Detroit and then come down to, uh, I think, Fort Wayne or something like that, one of those cities, and then drive over. And I would go from a T-shirt here to a coat uh, and everything I could put on to keep from freezing to death there. Very different. Wow. Wow. Well, you you picked a good place to um, grow your ministry, that's for sure, and, and that certainly has impacted. Yeah, that's right. The the way you've done ministry. So let me ask you, how did you choose Grace? How did Grace hit your radar even as an option for um, your D men? Uh, I'll try to make this a short story, uh, and I'm not even sure I understand all of it. But I started uh, my D men at Dallas, um, and but I always wanted to go to Grace. But I wasn't sure I was really going to have the money to do either one. So I did two courses at Dallas and dropped out. Well, Billy Graham's brother, Melvin Graham, yeah, started coming to my church when I was in Charlotte, when I first started at Grace. And he got wind that I didn't have the funds to go to to do this degree. And Melvin... uh, Unlike Billy, Melvin was very wealthy, very oh, okay. wealthy. He's okay. Of, he passed away, but he's one, he was one of the wealthiest men in Charlotte. His son is one of the wealthiest men in Charlotte to this day. But anyway, Melvin found out that I didn't have the money to do it, and he came over one day. He said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Grace. And if I remember correctly, he cut a check, and that was it, and I was on my way. Wow. The Lord answers in amazing ways. That's unbelievable. I always got magazines, uh, the, the ca- I should say catalogs from Grace every year. I always wanted to go so bad. And I would get these catalogs that had the teachers and I always admired Whitcomb and some of the other guys that were there back in the day. Yes. And I always wanted to attend there. And when he cut that check, I was on my way. So what were some of your memorable experiences? Do you remember any professors or classes or subject matters um, from your time at Grace? Of course. Uh, You know, one of the things that I enjoy most about Grace, uh, and this is kind of the signature of Grace, is their commitment to Scripture. Hmm. Uh, And that, that, that was one of the things I always wanted. And going to Grace just, uh, like drill down deeper my commitment. I, I wrote my dissertation on the uh, um, inspiration and authority of the Bible. Wow. Yeah. And uh, uh, Ken Bickle. Yes. Was a f- former professor. Uh, helped me write that thing. You know, he was my advisor and uh, it was really difficult, but he helped me kind of step by step and get my way through it. But Ken was a great speaker. They brought in a, a great teacher. They also brought in uh, outside speakers. Um, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, there were a couple from Dallas. There were some from Western. Then there were just pastors that they would bring in. But it was always very, very helpful. Now, you, uh, you've you done a whole host of degrees from various institutions, which would indicate to me that learning is um, something you find important or at least a, a significant hobby. Talk to me a little bit about your love of learning. Well, you know, one of the things I've always tried to do, and I say try, uh, is to be teachable. 
uh, and always be able to learn from other people. And especially back in the day before the advent of internet, you, you really needed to get out of your space and go somewhere. And uh, I just always felt like I was, I always felt like I was not a great leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always felt I needed help with that. Uh, I would, uh, you know, sort of offset that by hiring people on staff who could help me with that. But I always felt like when I went away from where I was and sat at the feet of men who knew far more than I did about the Bible, about ministry, uh, I came back advantaged. And so mm -hmm. I always felt like the, the people at Grace were, uh, in my opinion, were the best of the best. That's a great lesson for all of us, just about the humility and value of learning for others in the expansion of our own leadership capacity. And uh, that that has serviced you well, obviously, at a at a growing congregation. I, I feel like God, you know, made it clear to me, hey, Blackwood, you're not the smartest guy in the room, so you need help. And so I, I, I got that fast. And so going to somewhere like Grace was uh, I always, I always felt like it was an honor and a privilege. Well, tell us a little bit about your church, um, the makeup of your church, or even sort of historically when you got there. And I even know at the beginning there were some of those leadership struggles, right, right at the beginning, and and how you overcame those, and how the Lord has worked over the years. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll try not to to repeat the book, the the uh, the the recent magazine article, but I'll give you the short version of it. I, I came here uh, in 1996 uh, to what was then First Baptist Church of Perrine. Uh, it was a hundred year old church. Mm. Uh, so very old uh, Southern Baptist. Uh, a, a good man had pastored before me, a, a great man of God. His name was Tommy Watson. Uh, and he, he, just, he was just a great man of God. But uh, Tommy told me, he said, Rick, I had a vision for Perrine. He said, you had a vision for the entire city of Miami. And that, that, that was kind of the difference. Uh, and God even gave us a vision for not just, not just Miami, but how we had a vision for the places where our people came from. Mm. Um, our church has 60, I uh, say 60, now it's like 70 plus different nationalities of people. Wow. Born somewhere else other than than in the United States. So it's a very diverse congregation, very colorful. Uh, I always look out. It looks like a quilt to me. I see all different kinds of, uh, of colors in it. It um, sounds like the throne room of Christ uh, is going to look like someday, right? It's a testimony to God's creativity. You know, yeah, I'm glad exactly. God didn't make, you know, Adam and Xerox copies of him. You know, right. he, he made us so different in uh, male, female. You know, I say male, female, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, uh, red hair, black hair, no hair, green eyes, brown. We're all so different. And this this church just reflects that in an incredible, incredible way. It's been so much fun uh, to pastor it. Um, it. You know, it was it, it was one of one of the factors that made me a little bit nervous about coming to Miami because that was what was surrounding us. Miami is a very international city. Uh, only about my understanding now is maybe about 12% Anglo, maybe, maybe less than that now, maybe down to 11%. Uh, so I remember a, a missionary friend of mine saying he, I would never go to Miami. He said, you've got too many cultures down there that you're trying to, to fit into. But I, I felt like God said, if you go, if you show up, which is what I did, I showed up. Uh, I felt like God said, I'll take care of it. And I wish I could say, here's the incredible strategy that I had to create this diverse church. Uh, my strategy was I showed up and trusted God and he, he brought this incredible group of people together. Talk about those early, early days. And you mentioned the, the vision for Miami, but you're at a church that um, had historically had a different vision. And, and, you know, as some pastors may be listening to this in a similar situation of, hey, my, my church is not where I envision it going or where I believe God wants to take it. Uh, how did you walk through that process of expanding the vision of the church and bringing leaders alongside to assist you? Well, you know, uh, boy, there's a big gap between the way things are and the vision that you see. 
And it's that gap that is the most difficult. I could see where God wanted to take this church. Uh, there, at the time, there were a lot of pastors that were fleeing Miami. Um, I remember when I first got here, I was I had been here about a month, and I was at a mall called the Falls, and I was walking through the mall the, through the mall, and um, a pastor came up to me and and uh, he, he asked me he said What are you doing here? Hmm. I thought he was asking me what I was doing at the mall. So I said, well, you know, I'm shopping, trying to find some, some trousers. You know, he goes, no, what are you doing in Miami? And I said, well, you know, I feel like God called me here. Excuse my language. This is what he said. He said, you need to get the hell out of here. He said, oh, wow. He said, I'm getting out of here. He said, Satan owns this place. It'll destroy your family. It'll destroy your kids. Uh, a little bit later, a couple months later, I was at a a pastor's gathering in Broward County, which is the next county up. And uh, I was kind of a new kid on the block. I wasn't saying much. And we took a break in the meeting and I started walking to the restroom. Two, pa two men from the Florida Baptist Convention cut me off and they said, hey, we, we need to tell you that the Florida Baptist Convention has basically drawn a line at Miami and we've, we've given up. And I remember I didn't even go back to the meeting. I went out to the car and I said, I was scared. I, I said, God, where have you brought me? Uh, and God just gave me this peace. Um, and he just said to my heart, Rick, I, I need you to stay. And I'll help you if you'll just stay. And that's what I did. I said, okay, you know, Lord, I'll stay. Uh, this is scary. I don't know why preachers are fleeing from this place, but they were. Uh, a lot of the people who I say a lot of people, some of the people who called me that were on the search team after they got me here, told me they were leaving. Wow. So that that sort of scared me a bit. Uh, but I would look around and think, why are people scared of this place? This is amazing. You know, and, and God began to put, put a piece of my heart. And we, we ran into some problems with um, the church was controlled by a group of people. Who, who would leverage the bylaws and the constitution against me. And um, I remember I would go in these meetings, I would have this, this vision and they would, they would always take those documents and shut me down. And they made it clear they were in charge. They were, they, you know, they ruled the church. Uh, and it was frustrating my staff. We had a much smaller staff at the time, but we were in a meet, we were in a staff meeting. There were maybe 10 people around the table at the time. And I, I confessed to them, I said, I don't think I can lead us out of this because I just don't have what it takes to overpower these guys. They're too overpowering for me. It's not my personality. And one of the guys on our staff who's still here to this day, his name's Tony Isaacs. Tony said, Rick, you don't have to lead us there. He said, just, just lead from the pulpit. And that was like ding, ding, ding for me. Just lead from the pulpit, which I now have a new ministry I'm starting calling lead, called Leading from the Pulpit. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but what I, what, I, what I found was I, I started doing that. A lot of what I was getting at Grace at that time reinforced it was that, that accuracy of the Bible, the authority of the Bible. So I started teaching through uh, different books of the Bible. And one I taught through was, was Second Timothy and on purpose. Uh, so that it can emphasize all scriptures given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Also would go over to the verse where Paul told Timothy, preach the word, uh, be instant in season, out of season. Reproof. And, and I would say to our people, I would say, what is the authority, the Bible or the constitution of the church? Well, they would shout out the Bible. <laughs> what makes the decisions, the Bible or Robert's rules of order? The Bible. So people began to realize the authority was not. So I let them know. I said, well, that's not what's going on behind the scenes at our church. I'm being controlled by people. So I laid the cards on the table. Wow. I did. And these people came after me. They sent people to my former church to try to dig up dirt on me. They would stand at the doorway and hand out leaflets saying that I was a false teacher. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Kept teaching, kept teaching. And uh, it all came down. I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. It came down to one night, uh, this big meeting. And uh, I was scared to death uh, because there were about 100 people who wanted me out. 
and about 700 who wanted to keep me. And I remember I stepped up and I took the microphone in my hand and I don't use a handheld microphone, but my hand was shaking. Mm. I was so, so scared of the situation. And the former pastor, Tommy Watson, was sitting on the front row. And he asked me, he, or he said to me, he whispered to me, he said, Rick, let me talk to them. He was whispering to me, let me talk to him. Let me talk to him. So I was like, okay. Oh boy. <laughs> so Tommy gets up. I'll make this quick. He gets up and he said, he said, folks, I'm going to tell you what Rick's problem is. He said, Rick's problem is the same problem I had when I was here. He said, it's that man sitting right there. And he pointed at the guy leading the charge. Oh yeah. Wow. And, and the guy stands up and says, how dare you call me out like that? You, you, you're lying. So he starts walking down the aisle. Oh yeah. And his face is red. And I'm thinking, we're going to have a, a yeah. fight, Tommy and this old, and both of them are older guys. Long story short, I keep saying that, but right when he gets right in front of me, there was a little a Spanish lady named Dee Dee who was sitting right on the edge of the, what we had pews then she was sitting right on the edge of the pew and right when this guy got right beside her she takes her purse and swings it <laughs> in the face i kid you not there's no movie on this <laughs> nearly nearly knocked him off his feet she hit him so hard and when when she did that there were a group of men seat, seated behind me uh, the deacons of the church picked that guy up and carried him out uh and the church voted they were aghast at what was happening and they voted those people out they left the next week we had our first membership class our first 101 class and i think it was like 96 people joined and i, I asked him i said why would you join a church who just had a fight like that <laughs> and, and they said we were watching to see if you were going to lead through because we were not going to join unless you did Wow. Well, what I found, Drew, was that this is what I discovered in that moment was that I could lead everything from the church, from the pulpit. I could lead change. I could lead vision. I could lead mission, I, mission, vision. I could lead strategy. I could lead spiritual growth. And the confidence that I was getting from grace at the same time that, yeah, this document's accurate. It's true. It's trustworthy. It was like, you know, it was like the the right things coming together at the right time. And, and Christ, we changed the name to Christ Fellowship. The church took off. That is amazing. What, what a story of God's goodness and the sufficiency of Scripture. You know, and, and that is one of the things that comes through so clearly in the article and even on your website, um, you know, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, we work through the Scriptures. It's the Bible, the whole Bible, nothing but the Bible. And, and and generally speaking, my perception of of uh, big church culture is that is not necessarily the number one tenet for a strategy for church growth um, a, that you see elsewhere. And yet you've put it out there front and center um, in Miami, Florida, that it's it's the Bible, the whole Bible, nothing but the Bible, verse by verse. How has that worked for you? As a as a growth strategy um, in a multinational uh, church. Well, I, you know, I have to be honest. I didn't I didn't think of it as a church growth strategy at the time. I, I, I didn't think you know teaching through books of the Bible will be the the church growth uh, you know magic uh, prescription that'll sure. But but I did believe in the the authority of the Bible, and I felt I always felt like what I had to say to people was was insignificant and inconsequential. I always felt like what God has to say is what they need to hear from. So it was more of this thinking that was going on in my head. They don't need to hear from you, Blackwood. They need to hear from God. And I felt like the best way to do that was to let let the diet of scripture set set the calendar, the preaching calendar for us. Mm -hmm. So, but what I found was you know, even though we were going through books of the Bible, it was not like a run on commentary. Sure. Uh, we, we, it was, it was like topical preaching. Each message had a proposition to it. Each, each part of the Bible had a series to it. So it's interesting. We've been going through the book of revelation. Now we put it on park 
uh, it, it, it put it to the back for a little while, but we went through Revelation through the first six chapters. Uh, it took us about two years just to get through chapter seven. It was one of the most, fun, but but we divided it up into series. So there was a series, like we had a series called Miami Vice, which was, <laughs> yeah, which was, uh, it was one that just jumped in my, my, my mind, uh, which was the series on several of the churches in Revelation that were very, had, had a lot of vices. And we talked about how those vices were like vices that we face here in Miami. So it's very topical yet expositional at the same time at the same time. But the one thing I found, Drew, was that that kind of teaching uh, cuts across uh, cultural barriers. It cuts across, it, it fits everybody. In other words, it just seemed to be what God wanted to do to draw in this multicultural congregation, and it appealed to everybody, and people started coming, and the word spread. Um, I remember somebody telling me they were they had started going to a cat they were they were Catholic and they were going to a Catholic church and the priest they said they asked the priest something about the Bible and they said if you want to know about the Bible go over there to Christ Fellowship that's that's oh. what they did. <laughs> so here we are there you go uh, referrals hey why not right glad to have you how has your um, leadership and you said leading from the pulpit uh, how has your leadership had to have to change from you know leading seven eight hundred to leading 10,000 plus at multiple sites. Um, how's your leadership had to change or grow? Well, you got to find a lot of people who know how, who know stuff that you don't know. You know, uh, I knew very little about um, the multi-site church. Uh, I knew we wanted to reach the whole city. Uh, you know, God eventually gave us this bigger vision to reach the Caribbean, to reach uh, Latin America. Uh, so we had to have a, we had to have people who had expertise that that I didn't have. So, like I said, you know, I'm never going to write a book about here's 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 how to do this, you know, because it would take all the people who've helped me. But I always delegated, you know, to my weakness uh, and and gave uh, people uh, empowered people to do what they knew how to do. Uh, I've always been self aware of my own in, inadequacies, uh, and there's a lot of them. Uh, so I, I just tried to find, you know, the, the best people I could find in their expertise, whether it was worship, where, whether it was multi-site ministry, whether it was uh, student ministry. I just tried to find the best people I could find to help me. Mm. Uh, I think one of the things our staff realizes when they get together is, boy, Rick's not the smartest thing in the world. We better step up. <laughs> so, so it's fun. You know, I watch them do their thing and they watch me lead from the pulpit and it works. Well, the humility to, to, to know that you need others and then to empower them to be able to do it uh, is what allows, I think, for growth to happen. Because there's no way you could do it all on your own um, at 700, much less you know, 10,000 plus. So that's amazing. Um I want to turn a little bit from talking about ministry to, to some of the, your personal life and, and some of the health um, struggles that you've faced and, and what the Lord has taught you through those. Um, you, you've gone through a, a few different struggles, um, most recently uh, cancer. Um, and talk to us about uh, what God has. Talk to us where you're at currently, health-wise. Um, that would be great just to know. But just what God taught you through those various health struggles that you've experienced in the last six, seven years. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've suffered a heart attack in 2011 and then stage three colon cancer in uh, 2016. Uh, you would think I would be an unhealthy person, uh, well, I, looking at you, you can tell that's not the case, you know? Yeah. Well, I would be a case study on uh, this guy did the right things, but it didn't work, you know? Uh, but I'm, I'm 5'8", weigh 143 pounds. Uh, so I'm not a big guy. I've always kind of been a picky eater, not a big eater, always run, you know, jog, run, that kind of thing. So, but in spite of that, uh, I got hit with all of, all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but you know, it, it, I, it, I think the one thing it reminded me of is uh, you better do what you're doing to the glory of God because you might be face to face with him like instantly because the heart attack almost put me face to face with him quick. Uh, wow. Was that a complete, I, you know, well, heart attacks are always a surprise, but was, I mean, was that sort of a, 
One moment you're healthy and the next moment you're in the hospital. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I had wow. run three miles that day. Uh, and while I was running, I had a little something happen that I didn't know what it was at the time, felt something. And so I walked back, should have told my wife, but I didn't. And then uh, three o'clock in the morning, I uh, feel like, you know, somebody's jumping up and down on my chest. I, I got up out of the bed, went to the restroom, flipped on the light, looked in the mirror and saw that I was pouring sweat. So I started back to the bed to wake up Rhonda, realized I wasn't going to make it. So I literally tried to fall on her because she's a fairly sound sleeper. Mm. Did fall on her, woke her up. She flipped on the light. She said, Rick, you're having a heart attack. So she calls the paramedics while she, we had, uh, uh, our house at the time had a, uh, electric gate. So she had to go out and let the paramedics in well, while she was going, my vision just started coming in like this from the side. Uh, and I thought, this is it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. And I remember thinking to myself, everything I'm worried about right now is about to not matter. <laughs> All the stuff in the church is about to not matter. I'm about to be right in the middle of revelation chapter five. And I was kind of, what amazed me was how, how excited I got about it. I was, I was like, man, let's do this, you know, and went completely blacked out. And then the next thing I remember, I could hear Rhonda calling me, you know, Rick, come back, come back, come back. And it was like the screen just came back on and she was literally in my face, screaming to the top of her voice. And, um, the paramedics, there were a couple of them from the church, as it turned out. They were like, Rick, take these aspirins. We got to go. Uh, we got to get you fast. And I overheard one of the, it was a girl who comes to the church. She, she was talking to the hospital and she said, have the cardiologist meet us at the door. I don't think we're going to make it. And so I thought, well, I'm still not out of the woods, you know, but I survived that. Uh, and then 2016, out of the blue, uh, stage three colon cancer, but I'm clear two years on that. Feel great. Uh, started back light running, uh, not heavy, but light running. Uh, I still do, uh, I try to do a hundred pushups, not at once, hundred pushups a day. Good. Wow. And I try to do 40 pull-ups a day. So that's, that's kind of my exercise routine and it works. I should get on that exercise routine and uh, <laughs> I say I do pull-ups, but it's usually from the chips, from the bowl to my mouth. So I'll have to come up with a new version of pull-ups. Well, how has that changed your uh, ministry perspective? Uh, has, it, has it informed how you deal with folks going through difficult situations or even how you interpret and preach the word? Uh, you know, I, I try to lace my sermons with personal stories, uh, and those have just fit in, you know, to be able to even going through the book of revelation to be able to say, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we we go through troubles and, but, you know, there's always that, that big light <laughs> as it were, you know, the hope that awaits us, um, uh, and to tell that story, I, the story I shared with you, I, I share with our congregation that, that I thought I was dying and I was excited about it. So mm -hmm. as I, as, as in, in Revelation 4 and 5, uh, we did a whole series. I, I, I entitled the series. It was about six weeks. The series was, was called I Don't Want to Go to Heaven uh, because it's the way most people feel, you know, and, you know, at least not right now. You know, I, 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 I want to be there, you know, when I've had all my fun and I'm old and there's nothing left on earth to do. Okay. I'll be glad that heaven's there to get me, but not now. Yes. Uh, so we talked about, you know, heaven. Uh, we talked about how heaven is, is, um, uh, not the final destination. Uh, we talked about it as a, as a stopping point, but the final destination is a new earth, uh, where you'll have a body. I said, it'll be a lot like this earth. So all of that, those stories just figured in, you know, even though, yeah, I'm dying, but I'm excited because I've got this incredible, incredible future ahead of me. And so do all who are in Christ. So mm. it made a big difference. Yeah. One thing I did want to uh, talk about as well is um, 
how you have learned and grown from the multiple perspectives that are brought to your church body, uh, the, the different countries, the different races. Um, how has how has that informed you about Christ and His church, and, and how has it shaped your church? Yeah, you know, I, one of the things I I, I, I always think our church does not appreciate or doesn't recognize how different it is. I, I tell them, you know, I'll get up sometimes I'll say, you folks don't realize how, how unique this situation is because all they know, you know, they only know multicultural. Uh, I'll tell them, I'll say, you know, sometimes I visit other churches and I'm like, thank God for Christ fellowship because, uh, you know, we, we celebrate it, but we celebrate it uh, kind of what I was saying a while ago, we celebrate it as one of God's attributes. And one mm-hmm. of God's attributes is that he's creative. Uh, he likes He likes color. He likes differences. He likes uniqueness. And, and, and again, I always tell our people, aren't you glad he didn't make Rick Blackwood and Xerox copies of this? You know, um, I, one, one weekend I, I, I spoke about this, I think from Revelation chapter 5 every tribe. And I brought up the, the different kinds of people to show the diverse, to show the creativity of God. But it wasn't just male and female. It wasn't just black and white and Asian and Hispanic. It was also tall, short, black hair, red hair. We brought all these different people up, uh, blonde hair, brown hair, no hair. We bought, we, I think we brought uh, Sammy Flores up. Uh, <laughs> we brought up blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, uh, big, small frame. And, and just like, and every, every person who came out had what they were different, you know, uh, you know, blue eyes, you know, and wow. just stretched all the way across. And, and I said, here's the thing, what, what God gives to us to show us his creativity satan wants to use against god you know let's never let him do it and you know it was big yay go 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 christ fellowship so yeah it's been fun to 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 be able to celebrate that each one of those uniquenesses expresses the image of god in a different way and i have a i have a multinational multicultural family and we talk about that even with my kids who are from different countries and have different colors and just say you know, each one of you is made in the image of God, and and you you express a different characteristic of of just how amazing our God is as as one of His image bearers. And um, you're right. You know, we live in a context here in Northern Indiana that um, multinational, multicultural church is is more foreign to us, um, and and so it's neat to see. How the word of God is applicable to all of us, um, regardless of geographic location or regardless of, of race or ethnicity or color of hair, um, the, the word of God's applicable to all of us. And that, that's so neat. Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, sometimes at the end of this podcast, we like to ask just sort of a uh, popcorn questions um, to get to know somebody a little bit better. So they're a little bit off the wall questions maybe and a little bit different, but it helps us get to know you a little bit better. And one I've been itching to ask this whole time because you're sitting um, in a room and you've got a bunch of books behind you. Uh, looks like commentaries and, and all sorts of all sorts of good books. But um, what book do you like to gift others? Uh I, I, if, if, if I'm giving a gift and I, I gave this to all our staff is, is, I, I wouldn't recommend that you do this necessarily, but it's a book called the Valley of vision. Uh, it's a book of prayers from the Puritans. And that makes me sound like, you know, oh guy, he's into the Puritan stuff and the reform stuff. I'm not, uh, but, uh, the, we're good pietists up here though, at uh, grace college. And Seminary, <laughs> so that, that works. <laughs> You know, I just, it's its just a book that I pull out and read those prayers, you know, that they wrote and oh, just, I, I love them. You know, and from time to time, I just, I just take a picture of one with my camera and send it to different people at different times. It's, it's, a, it's a book I kind of carry with my Bible, you know, that book and 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, lunch. If you got to select one person um, to have lunch with uh, besides Jesus, it can be a Bible character, but it can't be Jesus, um, who would you select and why? It can be historical, it can be current day, whatever you would decide. Gee, I never thought of that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Maybe right now might be Tiger Woods. Yeah, wow, that's a good selection after the Masters win. You no, know, here's the guy who who um, has been through it. You know, was was high on the on the top of everything, completely fell to the bottom, and somehow uh, kept scrambling and scratching and and won the Masters this past week. And I'd love to sit down and say, tell me what it was like in the valley, you know, and tell me how you worked your way through that. I think that'd be amazing to hear. There may have been a few church skippers last Sunday on that Masters, you know, since they decided to play it in the morning. I'm not sure. Um, I I must admit I went to the early service. So, uh, (laughs) okay, so uh, one last question for you. What's been your favorite vacation? You mean one-time vacation? Yeah, what a vac- place you've traveled in the world or a place you've been able to visit? What's been a what's been a highlight vacation for okay, you? Okay, I'm gonna tell you this. I'm gonna tell you this, but my wife always says, "Don't tell people about this place because it's getting too crowded." And ah. it is. But our go-to place for uh, for years and years and years has been a place called Ocean Lakes Campground in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It is the most amazing place. Uh, it uh, has about a mile mile of ocean front. And then back towards what would be like the main road uh, is about, I would say, a couple of thousand homes that you rent or about a couple thousand camper spaces. Uh, we've always rented one of the houses. But once you get in there, it's, uh, it's, it's like a gated place. The man who started it was a believer. So it's, it's, it's uh, at 11 o'clock, uh, it, it shuts down. And uh, you can't cuss in public, all these kind of things. But once you get into this campground, everybody converts to golf carts. Oh, nice. Yeah, this has been going on since 1983 before golf carts were popular. Uh-huh. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you got thousands of golf carts, people out riding, talking to their hamburger places. There's uh, to do your laundry, to do your great. It's all self-contained. You don't even have to leave if you don't want to. It's If you've got kids... I'm telling you, my my grandkids now are like, please, can we go to Ocean Lake Campground? And we'll probably go this year. We, uh, my my 12 year old granddaughter, I don't think has ever missed a year. Wow. Well, I could I could bring my kids down and ruin all the peace uh, of the of the of the location if you'd like. <laughs> I'll me. let you know what week we're coming, so your wife can schedule a different week. So that was good. <laughs> Well, Dr. Blackwood, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for letting us uh, tell your story in the Grace Story magazine. Um, thank you for being an advocate for, for Grace College and Seminary. And we're just so thankful to have grads like you um, out in the world making a difference for the name of Christ and giving him all the glory for doing so. So I appreciate you taking the time today to be with us. And I hope anyone out there who has enjoyed this will uh, like it and share it. And of course, uh, you can find this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube. And uh, we just appreciate, Dr. Blackwood, you joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Hope I can get up to grace soon. <laughs>